talk to me uh, about y'all gave, did we give the books out? Pop, grab a mic. Uh, or somebody help him out. Carlos, run up here and grab that mic. We gave out our first hundred and something, 120 books. Daddy God, we got some more prisons coming up. But I wanted to hear a report, and we'll probably talk again Sunday. And uh, Father, I love you tonight. I praise you. I worship you. We're learning about covenant. We're learning about circumcision and about being free. This is the month of freedom. We're going to cut some things off this month, God. Things that are hindering us. Things that are binding us. Things that have cost us. We've got to cut some friends off. We've got to cut some the fat off of our lives that are dragging us. Things in our past. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. Circumcision has, has always been your way. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Pa, talk, come up, y'all come up, come stand right there a little bit. Just talk to me. Hey, Carlos, Woo. listen to my, what's up with this? Ta tell us what, we went, we went, we went Sunday to, uh, night. Tell me Alexander what happened. Alexander County Maximum Security Prison last Sunday evening. Uh, J.R., Johnny, and myself, we brought in a hundred books, 102 books, uh, Daddy God books, my permission of the uh, chaplain who uh, said this has never been done before, wow. and uh, as we prayed to go in there and took authority over all the enemies that are definitely around that wide up place, I uh, felt the presence of God, and we prayed for 100 men to be in the service, and there were 105. 120. You hear that ring? We got a ring. 125. 125. 125 men. That's counting the uh, chapel. Okay. <laughs> but uh, what was so amazing was they were so accepted. Uh, we preached from uh, page 33, which is about the orphan spirit. And uh, we had five times uh, the men me, stood up. Let me see the book number. Five times. Well, I'm going to let Johnny tell that because the man was talking to him about uh, how, uh, how awesome it was. You know, it's just, it's just a, a great experience to be able to go in and see. Uh, what you have to realize, these people, their souls, and, and, and to have an opportunity to go in, and they have nothing. I mean, most of these guys, uh, I'll say out of, out of the 125 that came in, probably 60 of them was lifers. And they range from the age of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. That's sad. Isn't it? And, 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 and all they have that is, is what we bring them. It's what we bring them. So for God to open the doors up and us to be able to bring the word of God to them, that's awesome. Ooh, I mean, that's awesome for it not to never, ever be done. And, and so, you know, when we go in, you know, we make it clear that we come in, we want to see them delivered, set free. Amen. We want to see them changed. You know, and there's a lot of other churches that go in. But, you know, a lot of them, the church that go in, they don't bring the word like we do. They don't, they don't preach the word like we do. A lot of them go in and they condemn them and they, 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 they push them down. But we try to go in and we teach and preach the word in love. And so, like you said, they're so receptive of it. And when you have, I think the, the last time we went in, I had a, a young guy that came after we had preached and we had sung and we had praised God. You know, they was, they was crying and they was just, just, just at peace. And, and when it's all over, you still have some of them that come that want special prayer. So we went in on Father's Day. When we went on Father's Day, that Sunday we went on Father's Day, I uh, had a young man that came up to me after the service was over with, and we just kind of headed out. He said, hey, Jack, come here. I need, I need prayer. I need you to pray for me. And, and, you know, we're in a hurry to get out because we've got to keep schedule. And so he said, would how you please you, play How long me? do you have? We're going to have about an hour, about an hour and a half, depending on about an hour, 15 minutes, depending on sometimes they'll let us go over. Okay. It just depends on, that's when the favor of God steps in. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we've prayed with them. We, 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 we sung with them. We, 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 you know, ministered to them. And you still have some. I had one guy that came up to me. He said, now, he said, this is, this is Father's Day. And I said, yes, it is. He said, and we thank God for you for coming out. I really appreciate it. He said, I'm a father. And he said, my daughter died today. Oh, man. So, I mean, what, 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 do, you, what do you do? I mean, what do you say? I mean, we've done all we could do, yeah. you know? 
And so they, they really appreciate us being able to come in and encourage them, you know, hope and giving them hope. Because, listen, if God don't move, <laughs> they don't have anything. Now, you guys go in the Holy Ghost, right? You're using Oh, them. God, yeah. When we go in, the first thing we do is we bind up the spirits. Amen. We take control of the atmosphere. Authority. We take authority. Amen. That's, that's key. That's let me key. Tell you one, this, uh, let me tell you one thing. We, uh, we're told by the chaplain that, uh, not by chaplain, but by the, the God, that uh, never in any of the services do any of the men ever stand up and, and act like they're receptive when they're receiving. Yeah. But we had the men stand up five different times, all 125. Now, you didn't have them stand up. They stood up. They stood up. They just while, stood while up. y'all were preaching and just singing. Preaching and singing. Johnny, that Johnny anointing, sings. Man, that's that anointing. How many want the anointing to yes. flow? Like, like the, I mean, Woo. the real anointing. Not church man, service, but God, Lord. the real anointing. So you, you preached on the orphan spirit? Yes. Did it, did it resonate. resonate with them? Yes, it did. Yeah. And I told... Uh, told them that um, it happened to me. I said I didn't know that I had the orphan spirit till I was 70 years old. Wow. I said my son preached this message right here and I realized that I was a uh, middle child and that my older brother was connected to my dad. My younger brother was crippled, connected to my mother. And so the only way that I could get attention was to be rebellious. Mm. And I said and that's why you're here because you done the same thing. So you've been rebellious and you know that. So they stood up, <laughs> stood up on that one. But look, God set them free. Praise God. Amen. Well, and, you, and, you, and you know, you, Amen. You, and you know, I rewrote the book and put that in it. I know. After that, After you preached that. I, I preached it and, and uh, started studying on it. And all, what cl clued me in on it was I heard somebody say the orphan spirit. So I, I looked it up. And when Jesus said this, this got me. He said, I, I will not leave you as orphans. Oh, yeah. And that, that got to me. Why would Jesus say that? I will not leave you as orphans. And what it realizes is, is that if he don't identify you, then you're constantly looking to be identified. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong with the church right now. Mm -hmm. the, what's wrong with the with the millennium? You hear yeah. that ring? Yeah. You hear that ring? Is that me? Is that him? Quit ringing the phone. You might shut it off. We can hear him talking, but what got me on that was uh, that's what's wrong with the church. We don't have identity. That's why That's why we, and, and listen to me, that's why we want to talk about freedom. That's why we want to talk about circumcision. That's why we want to talk about cutting things off. That's why we want to talk about laying it out there and being real. Lay it out there and being real. You can't keep sleeping in an unwed bed and expect covenant. You just got to be real. I'm not downing you. Walk with you, love on you. But there's certain things you're not going to get in covenant with God until you circumcise some areas of your life, uh, and myself included. This is, you know, it's not a, it's not a, 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 a checkout clause for preachers. Hey, you can preach, you can do what you want. The rest of you gotta, no, no. And uh, if you really want freedom, you gotta sell out to God. You just gotta sell out. You gotta sell out. And here's the problem: for your spirit man to sell out, your flesh man's gonna take a hit. You should wrote that down right there. That would have been good for somebody. For you to sell out. For you to walk in God's best, there's going to be something you, you don't want to let go of. You're going to have to. And now, that's hard. Let's be honest. That, that does, that's not getting preached like that. Do you know that they're, that, that they're sending me, my friend's sending me, you don't talk about tithe. You don't talk. I saw Bob, the video of Bob, and I said, well, Bob should have tithed sooner. He didn't have no arms. <laughs> so... <laughs> Then listen, this is sad because we're having to, we, 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 you can't just sit down and preach the, the word no more because people get offended. People get mad. People want to be comforted. And I'm telling you, if you never hear anything else, we are a judgment-free church. What I mean by that, hey, if, if you're living in sin, we ain't going to, we're not beating you over the head about it, okay? We, we will walk with you. We're going we're gonna to pray with you. We're going to love on you. We're not going to kick you to the curb. But somewhere you've got to realize you can't get the full benefit of the kingdom of God breaking God's laws. You can't. And there's some things God, and, and, and say, well, Bishop, when you talk about that, I'm uncomfortable. 
l- l- let me talk to somebody just watching. Just sitting there. Maybe, maybe, maybe I, when I said unwed bed, you got all freaked out. Hey, maybe you're living with somebody. You've been living with them for 10 years, and, and I mean, in, in the natural uh, scheme of our government or our laws, you, it's common law marriage. Technically, you're married. Uh, you do that, right? Technically, in common law marriage, you're married. Uh, so my thing is go ahead and make it right with God. Be covenant. Get in covenant. Right? Get in covenant. But and if you're saying, well, Bishop, we're working that out, then work it out because each man works out his own salvation with fear and trembling. That's not the couple. I'm not talking about the couple that's going to church, working it out, getting it right. I'm talking about the couple that says, oh, we're okay with God doing this. No, you're not. You're not. If you're, it, God's okay with walking with you through it. But when you start telling God, I'm going to do it regardless of what your word says, God says, no, that's a whole different thing. Now, that's called rebellion. God works your salvation with you. Now, I've been saved since 1978, but there are times in my, I grew up in areas, okay? I grew up in my anger issues. I grew up with my idea. For the longest time, my biggest thing was I was an affirmation junkie. I, I, was, I was addicted. I needed my, my, some of my greatest uh, problems for me wasn't that I didn't I didn't have I had a good image I, image is everything I, I, I had a good presentation let me say that I could enter the room and I had a good presentation and the law of presentation gives you access but it's the law of character that keeps you there okay and I have good presentation I had a, and and you can you know I can wrap the gift and it look beautiful, but when I open it up, eventually somebody's got to open up and look inside, you know. And you don't want to put a million dollar, a five dollar gift in a million dollar wrapping. You, you got salvation, that's the million dollar wrapping, but you keep the five dollar, five dollar you alive. Now you got to shift, you got to change. And and I remember uh, you talk about circumcision, right? We're talking about circumcision. We just kind of we just chilling. We're talking. You playing so good? Uh, ain't he playing so good back there? He's so awesome. I'm so glad he, he's my spiritual son. Do you like when he plays like that when I'm talking? He don't. He's tired. <laughs> Man, I can hear that guitar. Can you hear me, Nate? Can you hear me? Man, I'm loving that. I'm loving y'all's guitar back there, man. I mean, like Nate's uh, acoustic sound, man. We've been working on the sound at Carlos, and we got this guy Luke coming. And he's professional, and he can hear. But I mean, we always hear Matt, but it's the other guys we want to hear. <laughs> and so, uh, but l- let me just tell you, saved. I wrote a book called Saved but Damaged, and talking about cutting off circumcision. Why does God make a covenant with Abraham? He's Abram in Genesis chapter twelve, chapter uh, eleven or twelve. God calls into a crowd of people, and he sees who hears his voice. Now, you got you got to see what God's doing here because up to Abram, God didn't really talk to him. And let me, let me really go back and study your Bible. If you go back and read the Septuagint, God really didn't talk to uh, Noah. God, uh, uh, Enoch talked to Noah. Enoch was his, was his grandfather. And, uh, and so, you, you know, you gotta, you got to read the Bible and get out of the church culture. Okay, and get into the into the word culture. Okay, get out of church culture. Get into the word culture. And so you got a Adam getting kicked out of the garden. You got Cain and Abel. You got Cain kills Abel. So you see outside the garden chaos and and a chaotic world is beginning to form with people. You could talk about racism. Racism began when Cain and Abel walked out. You know what race, racism is? And it, and it, racism is as small as when two siblings are fighting over father's favor. That's racism. It just gets gets deeper and deeper and deeper as it becomes a, a race. But Cain is jealous of Abel. And instead of doing what Abel did, what does Cain do? He he kills he kills Abel. And so now you got murder. So now you got Noah, and then you know you got the flood, and then you, and, you, and if you really study the flood, it was God cleaning up the bloodline, and the Nephilims are walking, and the Watchers, and the fall, fallen angels, and that little little part of Genesis chapter six that you skip over 
when it talks about the Nephilims and it, ta- you know, Genesis, and it starts talking about, you know, the races and, you know, people don't want to talk about pre-Adamic race no more. People don't want to talk about where, who, who were the watchers, what were the angels, the fallen angels, what was going on, what were they doing? They were trying to create an army. What were they doing? But if you go back and study and, and the antiquities, you're going to find out that the, the fallen angels were trying to teach men how to uh, do things that were unnatural and doing wrong things and sexual immorality was just running crazy and and it wasn't just wickedness that god floods the earth it was to stop this bloodline of supernatural of this of these people trying to make a deity race to fight god okay that's why god said let's see what man's doing there's and then the the, the tower of nimrod the, the nimrod's trying to build a what a what a, a tower but in the hebrew it's a it's a portal See, but we ain't been taught this. What we're taught is that he's trying to build this tower. Why would God get mad at you building a skyscraper? What, what, what was it about the building that, no, it wasn't the building that God, it was what they were trying to do. They're, the, Nimrod was a hunter of the Nephilims or the watchers or the fallen ones. Nimrod is trying to make covenant with these demonic spirits for mankind. And they're using God's gift to do it. That's what we do. We use the talents of God to glorify the devil. That's what we do. That's our nature. That's the flesh nature. It's not the spirit. That's the flesh nature. And Nimrod is the first preacher in the Bible. Nimrod has a crowd. Nimrod has an audience. Read it, Genesis 8, 9, 10. Nimrod has a crowd. The Bible said he's a mighty manipulator. He's a manipulator. He's, he's, he's deceiving people. He's the first voice on the earth that's attracting a crowd. And God comes down because he sees the crowd. He sees what Nimrod's doing. And God talks into the crowd and has a voice that's come out. Who hears that voice? According to Genesis chapter 12, who heard it? Abram. Abram says, I hear a voice. Sarah's like, well, where? In my head. Well, what's it saying? Go out into the wilderness. Leave Nimrod. Leave the Nimrod people. Come out here. And what's God doing? He's looking for who's got the spirit of the ear of Ruach still in the blood. And Abram wakes up to, in the, and his spirit wakes up to the voice of God. Faith come by what? What is he called? The father of what? Why is he called the father of faith? Have you ever asked yourself? He lied. Called his, told the king his sister, his wife Sarah was his sister. Why is he called the father of faith? Because his ear heard the word. Faith cometh by hearing. He heard God. He comes out. God makes a covenant with Abram. Okay? Now... You go to Genesis 17, and Abram's 99 years old. He's 99 years old. God made a covenant. He was in his 80s. He tells him, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a nation. Da, 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 da. He gives him a word. Then he lets him live until he's 99. And here's what the Bible said. When Sarah's womb was dried up, and the seed in Abram was dried up, then God showed up and said, now I'm going to bless you. When does God start to bless me? When everything around me is dried up and nothing in the natural can produce without him. When is God going to show up? You, you got to hear what I'm talking about. When does God show up? When nothing else can pay it. Then God says, now you need me. If, if you can do it, I'm not going to show up if you can pay for it. Why? Because you don't need me. But when you can't get it done and it ain't going to move, that's why when the doctor says we've done, that's why when the woman with the issue of blood, when the physician said we've done all we can do but grew worse, then she got the revelation. I'm going to go to Jesus. God waits. He's 99 years old. Why? When the flesh was dried up. God comes down and says, and if you was looking at it, you can read it in, in Genesis 17, if you just wanted to read it. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, Abram, I am El Shaddai, 
what is, I am God Almighty, but that is El Shaddai in the Hebrew. What he, this is what he said, Abram, I'm the God who's more than enough. Oh, hallelujah. 99 years old. He said, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me. He already made it. Now look, God already made a covenant with Abram in Genesis 12. He said, look, he walked, remember the story? He walked among the blood. Remember? He makes a covenant with Abram. He already told him he's going to make him a father of many nations. He already told him that. Now he's 99 years old. God shows back up. And here's what gets me in, in, in Genesis 17. At 99, he's ready to manifest what he had promised in Genesis 12. Now he's going to manifest it in Genesis 17. And when he gets ready to manifest it, he's 99. He's got no life left in him but faith. Sarah is dried up in the womb. Now God shows up and says, now I'm going to give you a son. Now I'm going to make my covenant good with you. Why? Because you can't make it happen. Why? So when it happens, there will only be one person in your life to praise. Me. Now watch. When he gets him at 99, then he says to him, Abram, circumcise yourself. Read it on. You've got to read down there. I think verse 12. And he, and, he, and he said, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant. Now, why does God not have him circumcised in Genesis 12, 13? Why does he wait till he's 99? And he's already given him the covenant. He comes back at the end and says, wait a minute. Now I'm going to manifest it. But before I manifest it, Abram, you got to cut yourself. And here's, here's, here's what people don't want to hear. To get the full benefit of God, you've got to give up something you love. It's got to hurt. It's got to cost you. Then we don't talk about that because now you start thinking, oh, Lord, because you know, and, 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 and you, 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 relationship. The circumcision in the Old Testament and the New Testament are different. Circumcision in the New Testament is, is the heart. It's, it's just cutting off the things that are pleasurable to the, to the flesh. Not that everything that pleases the flesh displeases God. It's when you put the flesh before God. It's when you put your life before Him. It's when your kids' activities are more important than God's Word. It's when your pleasure is priority and God's pleasures last. That's when you need circumcision. Where you got to say, we need a detox right here. The flesh needs to be detoxed. That's what fasting's about. You know what fasting's about? You really think God says, oh, you know what, I just want you not to eat because if you don't eat, I'm going to let you have more power. No, it's about, it's about putting your flesh under what? Submission. Listen to me. You could go hours without eating until you decide to go on a fast. You decide to go on, and look, nobody will cook you nothing until you decide to go on a fast or a diet. Go on a, go on a diet tonight. You're, somebody going to come to your house tomorrow with a pecan pie. <laughs> as soon as you decide to give up something your flesh desires, your flesh be calling everybody on the phone. Hey, man, you need to bring a pecan pie over here. We, we need some. Your flesh is so powerful, it has to be beat down. Paul said, I have a diet of my flesh daily. Paul was arrogant. Let me tell you something about Apostle Paul. Most of y'all couldn't be pastored by Apostle Paul. Y'all need Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He was kind of down there. Paul, he was a scholar. He was a scholar of all scholars. One, I mean, he was a Pharisee. I mean, he spoke Greek, Aramaic, you know. And he come down pretty hard on you. He wouldn't play with you. He'd be like, get, 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 you know, they'd be like, Timothy, I want to be your protege. Really? Go in the room. Let, let's go. Here's the knife. So, let me circumcise you. No, no, I just want to carry your briefcase. You want to carry my briefcase? Then I'm going to cut you. You're going you're gonna to be marked as one of my sons. Now, here's the problem. When Elijah goes and gets Elisha, there's 70 other prophets in the school of the prophets of Elijah. So there's 70 plus Elisha. 
Okay? What you don't know is that, that Elijah picked them all the same way. He went and picked out. He, so he's got all these people following. But Elisha does not commit to Elisha for ministry. He commits to Elijah for connection. He connects to Elijah. And he covenants to give up his life. And for six years, Elisha doesn't do any ministry or prophecy. All he does, the Bible says, is wash the feet and hands of Elijah. He just washing his hands, picking them, pick them up after he eats, loving on him, caring him. Never ask for nothing. If you have to ask for it, you don't qualify for it. And the prophets are prophesying. They're going up to Elisha and saying, don't you know the masters, are, they, they're, they're working their gift. Don't you know that the master won't be with us long? He goes, yeah, yeah, I know, but let's keep that to ourselves. Three times they do it. And here's what. God's taking Elisha through the circumcisions. He goes to Gilgal. And Elijah turns and says, stay here in Gilgal. And Gilgal is the first place that God begins to qualify. And Gilgal is where Joshua circumcised himself. You can't go to Bethel. The next place was Bethel. You can't go to Bethel until you've been to Gilgal. Most of you have run to Bethel if you've stopped, never stopped by the mountain called Gilgal. That's what's wrong with the church right now. You've come to the house of God without the cutting or marking who you belong to. Now, I'm going to say something seriously here. Some of you have been coming to church and you still don't belong to God. I'm going to talk to those watching because there will be thousands watching. Some of you go to church, read your Bible, and you still don't belong to God. That's pretty hard. I didn't say God don't belong to you. God said, I never leave you nor forsake you. You know the difference between God and Satan? Satan will come in and walk with you and, and, and taunt you and get you into drugs, or get you out into a mixed gendered lifestyle, and when he gets you, or gets your marriage out there, or have you sleeping around, or going, come on, come on, you want to hang out, your, your, your wife ain't giving you, or your husband ain't giving you what you need, but I got some out here, and gets you out there, and as soon as you hook it, and you're in it, guess what he does, he'll leave you there, say, bye, I'm done with you, and never help you get through it, he'll leave you there to die, in prison, in the street, in the gutter, in a marriage, in four divorces, but God said, if I led you out, I don't care how you fall, I will never leave you there. That's why you want to follow God. Because if God's leading me out, and it's the wrong place, God said, I won't leave you here. I'm taking you through somewhere. Hell won't do that. Hell will leave you in it. How many know what I'm talking about? You've been through, you've followed hell long enough to know the old adage, sin take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, have you spend more than you ever wanted to spend. Sinning is costly. Living the sin life is costly. What if you could get back all the money you spent on sinning? How rich would you be right now? But Elisha is, 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 is being circumcised. He's going through Gilgal. He goes through Bethel. You, you, you got to go through cutting, then you, then you, then you got to get planted in the, in the revelation of God, the Bethel, the house. Do you know the number one ignored thing right now is really the house of God? We think coming to church is God's house. No, the house of God is when God and you become one. Because the Bible said, know ye not, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The house of God ain't this building you're supposed to be housing him. Now, I'm going to tell you all, on some of your houses, it's the word vacant because God ain't staying. It's too dirty a house. It's too messy. It's too cluttery. It's too much you and not enough of him. There's no circumcision. But if you want to see manifestation, you got to go through. He goes to Gilgal, then he goes to Bethel, and then he takes him to Jericho. And what? And, and, and 
And then he says, go. And every time he's telling him, leave, leave. And he says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm connected. I'm connected. I'm connected. It's when you uh, when you're feel like leaving is when you really need to be staying. Most church folk don't get that. You leave when you feel like it. And you didn't know is when you felt like quitting the church was when God was taking you to the next season. You were fixing to die to something and become something new. And then you end up in someone else's church and you got to go through the whole journey again over and over and over and over. And he takes him to Jericho. What is Jericho? What is Jericho? What happened in Jericho? What happened in Jericho? Who could tell me what happened in Jericho? What happened? Go ahead. Take a stab at it. What happened? The walls came down. You know what Jericho is? Jericho's the place where you start letting the walls that hell prison you in fall. And God said, you ain't going to go to Gilgal. You ain't never going to get to Bethel. And if you ain't never in the house, there are walls ain't never going to break in your life. Walls need to be broken. You got to come out. You got to quit being angry. You got to start being bitter. You got to stop being your past. You got to overcome racism. You got to get beyond the color of your skin. Injustice ain't leaving. You gotta quit, you gotta quit crying about the wall going up in Mexico. You, you gotta get off Facebook, okay? It's immaterial. Why? It's why does it bother you? It's a wall. They got a great wall of China that's been there for two thousand years. It, it, races have come and fall, kingdoms of it, right? It, you, you, you're getting stumped. You're letting the media pull you in. Get in the Word of God. God, what's your will? What's your word? I don't care if I'm Spanish. I don't care if I'm black. I don't care if I'm white. I don't care if I'm Malayan. I don't care if I'm Russian. I don't care. You see, if I'm in the word and God and the word is in me, then the devil can't touch me. I'm in covenant. You won't be all angry and throwing up and saying all this stuff on Facebook and going off and disrespecting your leaders and presidents. And it's crazy. The whole world is just vomiting anger. And, and, and church leaders, and I hope they're watching, some of my church leader friends need to step off the pulpit and go back on their face and pray. They're not leading their people. They're destroying them. They're not going to the pulpit preaching the right gospel. They're preaching a cultural gospel. And I want you to write this down. Your culture will not save you, but your kingdom of God will. One of the number one problems with the Spanish people. I'm going to tell you the truth. That's why they stay in their little groups. They don't want to give up their culture. You're not African, you're, you're American. You're not Chinese. If you come here, you're, you're an American. I'm an American. My heritage is Italian. And I'd never grow I'm Italian-American. Because I'm an American. Because I'm not picking up. A, well, you wasn't. Your, your race wasn't treated well. Let's talk about the Jews then, because the Jews were mistreated more than. You want to know the truth? The Jews were, Jews were mistreated more than the black folk. If, if you want to know, God's people been in prison and been enslaved, and then went through genocide through through World War Two. I mean, my God, go look at the bones that stacked up. Look at the ovens that they, you want to talk about injustice. Now I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to answer this, and this is not a racist, but I want you to think about something. Why is it that when I go to New York and I drive through all the Jewish neighborhoods, they live in big old houses and have big old Mercedes and they own all these businesses, yet they've been persecuted more than blacks? What's the difference? Does God love them more than us? Then what's the difference? Their attitude. You know what the difference is? They choose to learn from their past, not live in it. They have Passover. They talk about the, when they were in Egypt. They, they, they give God bread. They break the Torah. They read the word. But here's what they do. They go to a neighborhood. They set up the synagogue and a school. This is what they do. Okay? They go into a neighborhood. They put a school here and across the street, the synagogue. They go take their kids. They raise them in the synagogue. They teach them their history, not bitterness. They don't tell them. You, you, this is how they. This is how German treat you, white man, whatever. They don't teach them to hate. They say that you belong to Jehovah, and then teach them law of the tithe, the law of the seed. 
brings them over into their school and teach them the word of God and pay for it. They don't get no government help. So the government can't tell them how to teach their kids. Then they take their kids and tell them you can be an entrepreneur. And then if, if, if I'm a Jewish man in business, I'll take your kids and put them in business. And help them raise up. And they got this huge rich neighborhood. And they were persecuted. And they were in slavery. And they were almost exterminated. Threw in ovens, kids. I watched a, a documentary on the Jewish race and the Germans that secret tapes, and where they they were they they went to uh, Paris to get the men, and they didn't follow the instructions of Hitler, and they picked up all the children and the men, and they got there and they got all the men off, and there was thousands of children and no daddies or mommies. And they're in black and white watching because, see, Hitler documented everything because he thought he was going to rule the world. And they're talking to a soldier, and he's talking about, well, we didn't know what to do with him. So here's what they said. Well, what did you do with him? He said, well, he just picked the kids up by the foot and hit their heads on the, on the poles and kill them. Just hit them like rags. Killed them all. saying so somewhere somewhere we got to have a reality check either we gonna believe this word or we might as well just go home go we'll head by sauna and get a corn dog on the way or we gonna say no God is God of his word and you know what I don't care what color I am I love you whatever color you are you know why because if you in the kingdom I love you and if you ain't in the kingdom I still love you but can't coddle you tired of coddling. coddling you ain't going to cure you yes there's injustice yes there's slavery was in this country for 150 years ago yes it was wrong yes it, it was yes and I hate it but I went to Africa and went to the slave camps wasn't just America doing it I sat there and listened to them talk I was the only white guy in the whole tour. Well, I, and I asked the guy, take me through it. I want to see it for myself. I don't want to just read about it. Take me. And took me to the door of no return and said, when a slave, w when the Europeans or whoever, all of them would capture. And then he said, it wasn't just white folk because this tribe would want to take this territory and take these blacks and put them in, sell them, capture them and sell them. But he took me through the thing and opened the door, and I walked into the tunnel. And he said they would walk in here, and he said when that door shut, that was the door. They never came out of slavery. And I walked through it, and I was in, in the hall, and I started doing this. It's the, the hall. I said, what's going on? Why, why, why is it? He said, we're already breaking you. It's a mental thing. This is what he said. He said, you know what slavery is? It's not about color. It's about your mind. They're already breaking making you break this is how you walking in because these were proud men some of them were chiefs then they went the, and the women went this way and kids and the men went this way and then they packed them into a room thousand two thousand three thousand they stood there for three months waiting for ships door would open up they shut the lava it was pitch black I stood there I closed my eyes I could hear the cry and above them was the church the religious church my kingdom. My friend who's, who's from Ghana was standing there and he said, listen, if that was a kingdom church, it could never sit above the crying and pain of this. I saw it. I was there. It, 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 it was, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was life changing. Walked through the whole thing. But then I was sitting there and I saw what they had to go through and then here's, my, here's what God said to me. Do you know the resolve of a human who would come through this and death would be a reprieve to die here, but to decide to live, go get packed in a boat like wood so that you could get somewhere and birth a bloodline 
And that's what, and I thought, this is what I thought, that the black folk in America have no idea what their ancestors decided to go through so their seed could live in 2000 and that in, in, in 17. And it wasn't for their bloodline to go sit over here and live in poverty. If that's what your bloodline could withstand, you have no idea what's hidden in your DNA. And you over here crying, and you're and you they're rolling over in heaven, upset and mad because they didn't act as mad as everybody's acting right now in 2017, 2019, whatever year it is, 2017. That's what I'm saying. Because you if 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 it, people call me names all the time. If it's true, it hurts. If it ain't true, I laugh. Somebody got to say, hey, I'm, wrong. I'm, I'm going to Gilgal. I'm on my way to Jericho. There's some walls coming down here. I ain't got time to hear a naysayer. Listen, listen, God told me this a long time ago. Don't get off the chariot with the king to, to chase a tomato thrower in the crowd. Don't get off the chariot riding with the glorious king of all the earth to hear to get on Facebook and get in a comment battle with a tomato thrower. But God said to me, said, your friends don't need explanation and your enemies wouldn't believe you anyway, so why are you arguing with them? I'm just trying to prove a point. No, you're not. You're still wounded. But there's a healing coming. God said there's a revival coming. My friend Bishop, Bishop, uh, Bishop Tudor Bismarck said there's about to be an open heaven. I'm reading a book he wrote uh, uh, just teaching on all the open heavens through the Bible. And he said there's one last open heaven coming because the end of the church has got to be greater than its beginning. And it's going to be a plethora of race in that, in that overflow. And you know what? If you don't like someone else's color, you ain't going to be in that open heaven. You're going to be in that closed cultural church that thinks they got heaven. But when you get to Jericho, you're on your way to Jordan. When you get through Jericho, you're on your way to Jordan. And you know where Jordan was? The transition point between what you was and what you're going to be. Now, I can get you to Jordan. Because if you can get through Jordan, you're going to get the double portion. Look at somebody say, I'm going to get to Jordan. I'm going to get to Jordan. I'm getting to Jordan. I'm getting to Jordan. And to do that, you got to circumcise. You got you to listen to God's word. You got to quit doing all that other bad behavior. Just talking, some people are probably saying bad comments on Facebook. Every race has history. Every race. Why do the innocent? My friend, I was praying with him the other day. And he's a good guy. And he was crying to me because some, he had gotten in trouble. And he says, if I go to jail, they're going to send me back to Mexico. And I says, why? And he said, man, I've been in this country since 19. And I'm not, I'm not a citizen. And I'm praying for him. I said, man, we need to pray you don't get arrested here. And I was sad for him. And I, and I was rubbing his back and I was telling him, I said, you know, it's sad. Because then he was crying about, you know, why will they send me back? And I said, I hate it. I, I hate it. But let's pray. Let's just pray you that, you, you, that somehow something will work out in your favor. And I'm trying to call somebody to help him out because he's a good guy. He says, yeah, but I'm, I'm not bad. They should send bad people back. I said, you're right. Bad should go first. But then I just said to him, I said, I don't know why the laws are the way they are, but every country has laws, and you got to find a way to get legal. If you want the full blessing, we've got to pray that you find faith. 
because I can't compromise. But when we talk like that, say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're illegal, you're illegal. Now, we're not going to turn nobody in, okay? We ain't calling nobody. We're going to bring you in and help you. We're going to try to find, call Viviana, call lawyers, try to get you to. But, but we don't want to talk the truth. Nobody wants to talk about it. Illegal is illegal. Now, 40 years ago, people came over here illegally and they got citizenship. It's a whole different country today than it was 40 years ago. You got to admit that. But when nobody wants to talk about it, it's like this, you know, the big sore in the room. But if we don't stop coddling the wrong, we are never going to experience the righteousness of God. And not just political stuff, wrong within yourself. You know what God said to me the other night? It's your greatest enemy is you, not a devil. Because you can rebuke every devil in this room, but you can't cast you out. He got to get up with you tomorrow. He said, and if you're living a lie, if you're living a lie, son, that lie is going to cost you. That's why you want me to send mentors to tell you the truth. That's why you want people to wake you up. That's why you want the alarm to go off. Warning, warning, don't stay on this path. It's the serpent's path. It's beguiled. You stay here, you will die. This country needs a revival. And it's not going to happen if the church don't stop being divided and put this, this, these issues over here on a shelf and say, I, can't, I, I don't know why we are where we are. I don't know why. I don't know why things are where they are. But I know who sits on the throne. I know who is greater than that. His name is El Shaddai. And if I got to circumcise something off of my life, I will do it for your greater good. And we got to bind together and we got to protect one another. We got to love and we got to and we got to get on Facebook and talk good stuff and kind stuff and loving stuff and not political stuff and angry stuff and I, and, and, and you do you do know it's not your place to re resent I had I had a, I'm a fed up day today you shouldn't put that on Facebook why you're a believer it, you might be fed up but don't put it on Facebook why because you're gonna get you're gonna get caught up with God and be over being fed up but everybody else is fed up don't leak your feelings where the public can use them as weapons against your God Leak God's word. I like when Daniel is, gives his scripture. Sometimes I get up and read Daniel's scriptures. Why? Because sometimes I, I was in a hurry, and then I'll see it on Facebook and stop and read the scripture and say, man, I love that verse, and then go read the whole chapter because somebody put a scripture on there. And then I get on there and see some things of people, and I'm like, Ugh. And And my flesh wants to comment so bad. I mean, I'm like, and then I remember what I preached. Take my finger somewhere else. He's a good God. Yes, he is. <laughs> we just got to get a hold of ourselves. Kingdom churches are not, are not going to be the, the trend, but they are going to be powerful. And they're going to pack out because when, when people like Ron Carpenter and Greenville and Rod Parsons are going to stay in true to the Holy Ghost, you're going to see churches popping up. It's just going to fire is about to come out and we're going to be part of that fire how many want to be part of that fire lift both your hands let's be part of that fire fire father let the fire fall in this church we call the favor center let favor fall in the lives and let us overcome our, our our differences yes we all have different opinions yes we all think it should be one way or another way or this way or that way but in the end the word manifests its truth in the end your yeas will be yeas and your nays will be nays. In the end, your will shall be manifested. Ain't nobody on this earth going to stop your will or your plan. I want to be in your plan, not against it.
How many would pray that prayer say, I want to be in the plan, not against your plan? God, if I'm doing anything, would you pray this prayer? Would you pray this prayer? I want you to pray this prayer. Father, if I'm doing anything in my actions or my words that are going against your plan, stop me now so we don't become enemies. Because no one ever wins fighting you. You are the creator. I line myself up with you. Open your mouth and say this. I line myself. I align myself to your will. I may not always like it at the moment, but I know it will work to my perfection and good and prosperity in the end. I give my, I give my life to you. I give myself... Remember that song we used to sing, I give myself away. I want you to say that right now. I give myself away to you, Lord. To you, Lord, I give myself to you. My, ki my kids may not understand me. My spouse at this point may not understand me. My friends may not understand me. But that's okay. I'm okay with that. As long as you and me are good, God. Because when a man's ways are pleasing to you, you'll make even his enemies at peace with him. Hallelujah. Now, God, help me to build your house. Pray this prayer. Say, Lord, help me build your church. We are the church. Help me. Help me be a, a river of love, not a, not a lake of bitterness. Help me be the flow of Jordan and not the Dead Sea. I don't want to be full of poison, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, hate. I want to be full of love joy, peace, and gentleness, and kindness. I want my mind to not think on what CNN said or Fox News or I don't care. I want my mind to be steadfast on you, Lord. I want what Paul said, in you I live, in you I move, in you I have my being. I want to just tell you, I give myself to you, Lord. I give myself to my will becomes your will. My wants become your wants. My pleasure becomes your pleasure. My life becomes yours. Do with it what you will. Do with it what you will in my life. I will not walk in racism. I will not walk in hate. I will not argue. I will love. I will embrace. And I will grow and forgive. In Jesus' name. I said in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to say this to I let everybody off the hook that's hurt me right now. Because they're stupid out there on Facebook. They're stupid out there. And racism is stupid. It's stupid. To judge a person by their skin color is, is ridiculous. It's stupid. It's stupid. But we ain't stupid here, are we? Well, that's why we got multicultural church. Because we are one in faith. One in blood. One in his body. Amen. What's that? I give myself away. Doesn't that song say, my life is not my own? Is that, doesn't that say that, Jeremy? He said, Abram, you're going to circumcise yourself. You know why? My life is not my own. Just sing that. To you, I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. I give myself away. I give myself away. So you can use me, give myself away, oh, I give myself away, so you can use me. So 
we got to give ourselves to God. Let me tell you something. If God wants you in America, there ain't a wall anybody can build to keep you out. If God don't want you here, it don't matter if I didn't build a wall. Because in the end, God is going to get what God has always wanted, his will. It doesn't matter what people call you. What is God calling you? You know what my Bible said? God said, I call you blessed. I call you son. I call you whole. I call you healed. You remember that old thing, whose report will you believe? I believe the report of the Lord. You know what my life is? His. Once you give yourself away in covenant, covenant means he covers you. That means, that, you know, when, the, when I marry folk, I'll say, and when I marry folks, I'll say the two become one. When I marry folk and they make a biblical covenant marriage, do you know what I have to say over them? But you know what God said to Eve and Adam? He said, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. The two become one. You know what that means in covenant? That means the two come together to be covered. That means I don't see just two people. I see one. That's why you take on, that's why the wife took on the name of the man. That's why God told Abram, Shella, you leave your father and mother and cleave unto your wife. You know why? Because you, you're going to keep your name. She's going to give up hers for you. So she ain't told to leave. He's told to leave and cleave. The man was to cleave and pull his wife in. He was the the, the, the type and shadow of covenant. She will give up her name and take on my name. I will become covering. Well, now, we got men, they, they don't even want to cover their wives. They just they don't even want, you know what I'm saying? They don't know how to protect them. They don't know how to pray for them. They don't know how to be anything for them. But the covenant was set up for God to marry his church. And here's what he said. I'll be the man, and in the church, you're going to be the woman. And here's the deal. You're going to take on my name. You're going to give up your name and take up my name. So when the devil sees you, he no longer sees you. He says the two have become one. The devil can't touch you because he got to touch me. I'm the cover of this covenant. Oh, hallelujah. When the devil comes to slap you, he God standing and says, oh, you better think twice, buddy. You ain't slapping him. You slap. The devil said, I ain't messing with you. You know that in the book of Jude. Even the Lord rebuked and said, oh, you can have it. That's the covering. That's covenant. That's what we want. That's why when you're in covenant, you're covering one another. If you talk about people, you're not in covenant. If you can talk about other people that in your faith, you're not in covenant to that faith. Why? You ain't covering them. To be in covenant, I'm not going to let somebody talk about Chrissy. We're in covenant. They don't get behind her back and trash her. Why? Because I'm saying, no, no, I know her. I know, you follow me? Why? Well, we're covenant. We're connected. But if you want to talk about folk, you ain't in covenant. If we can trash the truth of God's word for the favor of being liked by the world, we ain't in covenant. My life is not my own. I married you, Lord. I give up my name. That's what he said. Now you'll no longer be Abram. You'll be Abram. Put the Ruach in you. And when I breathe ham in you, the seed that was dead is going to come alive at man in Manhattan. And look, Sarah heard, Sarah was in the other room and heard God talking to me. She started laughing. <laughs> he said, why is Sarah laughing? Because he's, he's thinking, it ain't happening. He man in man. He going to sleep before 8, 8, 8 p.m. He's sleeping. There ain't no Barry White being played up in this tent. And hear what God said to you. You tell by the end of this year, Sarah will be laughing. And they named him Isaac, the son of laughter. Because where it was dead, the end is going to be joy. I want you to tell you this. I got to go. Wherever it was dead and the enemy said it was dead, God said, I'm about to put some life back in it. And by the end of this drought season, you will have birth your laughter in the midst of your dead season. You're going to have joy unspeakable and full of the glory of God. If you believe that, give God some unspeakable joy right now. And say, I give myself away. I give myself away. I give myself away right now. I'm going to move it unspeakable. Stand to your feet. Hug somebody. Bless somebody. I love you. 
wasn't trying to offend nobody. If I offend you, I forgive you. I didn't mean to hurt you. I love you. I love everybody. I pray for you. I ask God to bless you. If you're watching, I love you. Not trying to offend nobody. Not trying to hurt nobody. But if we're not real, we can't change. You got to look at real and change. And I believe your future is greater than your past. In Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, our monthly book is Live It to Win as you sell your $65. If you're part of the church and you're here, we'll be ordering them and you can just pick them up if you're a $65 month seed sower. We won't mail it to you, but if you're out and you're sending it in, we'll mail it to you. And that'll be your July partnership gift. Thank you for being a part of our I campus. We love you. Share it, swipe it, get it on Periscope. Let everybody know we're teaching truth down here at the Favor Nation. Talk to you later. Take us away, Jeremy.